but I, I, I guess where I wanted to start was, you know, in that discussion and, you know, given some of the discussions you've had in the past, were there anything, um, was there anything there that you found particularly engaging or confusing or that you kind of wanted to ask here that we can you know, further talk about or further pull apart? Well, it reminded me of what is appealing about Sartre, to be mm-hmm. honest. Um, yeah. And I think you draw a bridge. There's this particular sentence. I'm going to try to find it. Um, okay. Where you, like, connect both of them in a way that is, like, I, it struck me as important. Because people will say things about how, like, supposedly existentialism and Marxism are kind of, like, clashing or conflicting mm-hmm. philosophical perspectives. But I think... Mm-hmm. The, what you do in this paper is, like, draw a bridge between them that makes yeah. a lot of sense. Um, yeah, that was a, that was something that I was trying to do um, a lot. And there's I think there's two ways that I think I might have been – I think that I did that effectively. And if you can find the sentence that you're referring to, please be, be, uh, be sure to, like, let me know. But I think uh, the big part – for me is this is the notion of um kind of existence preceding essence and what that really means essentially um you know for those who might not know uh, what sartre puts forward is a lot different than you know other um more classical modes of thinking about the human condition um his idea here and the idea that he puts forward that most existentialists hold is that the individual first exists in the world you know with this uh consciousness that he you know explicates in you know, most of his work um particularly being in nothingness um you know we exist as that first and through the you know the actions and the 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 things that we do in the world that's how we define our 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 existence essentially that's how we find an essence um and it's a it's a very um it's a very anti-essentialist position um which I think really gels well with a lot of stuff that you're interested in, um, you know, coming from like the Deleuzean side um, and the post-structuralist side of things. It's very anti-essentialist. Um, and I think that's a good way of kind of setting up, um, you know, what we can, we can apply that to the idea of labor. Um, and I think one of the big things that I wanted to stress with labor and that Marx kind of brings out, brings out in labor is that labor isn't just like, you know, this work that you do to survive the labor of, of human beings because existence precedes essence the labor is is our you know our productive means by which we materialize you know ourselves and materialize um and help to define who we want to be in the world um so like you putting together this podcast um you know if you were like let's say you were like like a joe rogan type like let's say you were a joe rogan type <laughs> um and you know this was you doing what you're doing to make money and to live i would assume and it's not just primarily because, you know, you're doing it because you, you want to exist, but you're doing because you kind of want to define, you know, who you are in the world. Like you weren't given the position of podcaster um, at the beginning of your existence. That was something that you took on. Um, that was a role you ended up taking on. And I think, you know, what capitalism does essentially is kind of really hurt that by making it a means solely for existence. It reverses the relationship. And that's really where the connection between Sartre and Marx comes from is that if we're saying the true position of the individual is existence preceding essence, Marx notices how capitalism puts existence first, not existence, essence first, as in an essential role first, and the labor activity is what allows you to keep yourself alive. And, you know, that's essentially laboring like an animal, which is, you know, the big meme, like, oh, you're in capitalism. Uh, Why are you depressed? Well, it's because you're an animal. Um, but yeah, uh, that, and that's just, that's what I was really trying to draw on in terms of putting the two together. There are other ways that people have tried to do that, and Sartre himself didn't really take this route, um, which, you know, for better or worse, I, I, I think I wanted to kind of draw this out and do something much different than he does, because his, his Marxist career is very checkered, um, and we could kind of get into that um, if we have time. But yeah, that was essentially uh, what I wanted to do in terms of putting them together. Yeah, I think you did it beautifully. And I found the sentence that I was thinking of. Um, Could you give me the page number? Page 10. 
Gotcha. Analyzing the particular situation of the worker to examine the universal situation of the laborer, or the waiter, sorry, not the worker, Mm -hmm. reveals capitalism as as a social exigency that limits and further obfuscates freedom in the form of labor it requires. Marx thus designates capitalism as the social apparatus that conceals freedom. And right there is when I thought, like, this is this is the connection. Like, yeah. And, and, you know, to talk about that waiter situation a bit more in being in nothingness, uh, Sartre talks about um, the, the there's a, you know, the famous idea of uh, bad faith, um, which is often employed in talking about some of Sartre's big ideas. Um, but in that in that discussion of bad faith, he talks about this cafe waiter um, who is you know, doing his job as a waiter, he's bouncing from table to table, doing what he has to do. And, and Sartre kind of notices that the waiter is moving almost like a, like a robot, essentially, like a, like a mechanized thing um, that regulates itself based off of some type of, you know, broader demand. Um, and what he, and he you know, the, the idea of bad faith is that the, the, the waiter is essentially running away from this, um, anguish um and you know that that idea the idea of anguish being you know the moment you kind of recognize the totality and the presence of freedom and for good reason right because i think you know there 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 was a there's a lot of reasons why you know you might want to run away from anguish because if freedom is so big and so vast it's really and since no choice essentially is telling you um is is directly um you know relevant or directly um you know applicable or directly you know, the most, the best choice you can make, because, you know, we're, again, working from this kind of anti-essentialist framework, if that's, uh, if that's the kind of way that we're looking at the world, the anguish and the freedom that gets revealed to the individual through anguish can be very stress-inducing, it can be very, like, harmful, like, you know, that might be the reason why the individual runs off into these broader social structures of exigency, like capitalism, Um, but I think the, the unfortunate result of that is is the fact that you know freedom is even further obscured here because not only are you you know running away from anguish but you're like i just said before um you're relinquishing your freedom entirely to private owner and you know all that other uh you know mark stuff and whatnot and that that, that was i think that was a that was a really good place too that i thought uh looking at the the particular how the particular situation of one person says something about the universal situation of others um and that, that was something that i kind of really want to draw out if that makes any um sense yeah that's people are getting to that point with a lot of different things i notice um mm-hmm. but like that anguish thing mm-hmm. I, I think it's yeah. interesting um yeah that the realization of this sort of like ultimate freedom and sort of condition conditionality of everything like like Mm -hmm. because basically what Sartre is saying is that like our human social world could all be different had had we made different choices basically yeah so that realization that like none of this is set in stone Mm -hmm. it's interesting to me how that can be felt as a painful experience for people yeah and i i I, and i think that's really interesting right because i and 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 i tried to and i really did try to give that it's uh it's just due in the paper primarily because and you know working with the um advisor that helped me put the paper together um one of the things she talked to she kind of informed me about is like you know individuals kind of you know run off into these kind of structures because they don't want to face the reality of freedom and i think that's interesting maybe it's because you know you know people like you and i um you know we are um you know i, I think anybody who kind of studies like i'm not trying to say this as a, like a, a braggy kind of thing but i think anybody <laughs> that kind of studies philosophy or any type of humanities um is very is, is are very open to the idea of freedom um and you know there are definitely ways that you know kind of run away from freedom and in your experience all the time, but I do I do agree that I think it's it's interesting that that this uh, 
kind of idea that is really powerful and very change like very life changing is something that most individuals run away from um and the idea that you know the conditions and social conditions that we have now are things that we could change if we weren't complacent in them you know and i think that's primarily some of the stuff that marx wants to bring out um as well you know and people a lot of people i think i see a lot of people rag online about the the communist manifesto but i think what it does one of the things that it does really really well is uh like the alienated labor manuscript is show people the the relevance and the role of their their in their their per, their their being essentially um you know who they are and and why what they're what they have and what they're dealing with is a raw deal obviously capital is a more um you know comprehensive look at at the system that makes our existence a raw deal but i think what the manifesto does really really well and what i try to do towards the end is show hey if this is what your experience is like if this is what our our world is like we should own it we shouldn't have a system that wants you not to own it either um and i think that's what's most uh one of the other things that makes marx and sartre you know very uh connected in that way is this you know need and call for you know liberatory movements and this call for liberation in general yeah because like for me that kind of realization Mm -hmm. of the ultimate kind of contingency of things is Mm -hmm. more it's more liberating than yeah yeah but how does this connect i'm interested to talk Mm -hmm. about how this um this idea connects to Marx's conception of class consciousness. Because for him, that seems mm. like the solution. But that, that notion is also kind of contested by a bunch of other thinkers as like a, a kind of a bad way out, basically. Because like, mm-hmm. what class are you going to make conscious? And is that even possible anymore in like first world conditions? Like these are all kind of like yeah. open questions that are debated a lot. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think, the class consciousness um, stuff works in in um, in coordination with kind of the embrace of anguish, or the really the embrace of freedom is what it is. Um, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, you know, kind of what Marx is I, you know, identifying with class consciousness is the 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 role or the 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 point in which you know members of the proletarian class kind of recognize their condition under capitalism, if I'm not correct, or if there's extra pieces to that. I don't want to, like, misrepresent Marx. That's basically it, yeah. Yeah. So, like, I, I think what the the Embrace of Freedom essentially does, um, on top of some other things, too, is um, kind of highlight that by saying, like, um, and I think I had a post about this not too long ago, but it's, like, the idea that we can be conscious like um, we could be class consciousness before being just conscious of you know who we are as individuals. I think is a is a pitfall because there's no real because if we don't recognize why we should be class conscious, um, you know, then there's no people really rallying behind the position or rallying behind the idea of um, you know the left essentially. And I think um, you know what the the ideas that I have here ultimately try to show is that you know as individuals who are um not defined in their existence um but is defining their dis- existence through their actions um we need a a social system that you know correlates that essentially we need a social system that facilitates our freedom not obfuscate us from it um and i think that is part of the reason why I I don't really see the um, the kind of because con- because you, you mentioned earlier that there's a there's been a lot of uh, you know people who think that Marxism and uh, existentialism conflict a lot but I think you know in terms of taking this angle on freedom and a lot of people do I think if, if I have if if I had to just like kind of look on not just online but just like in general I do think a lot of people when they talk about Marx or they think about Marx they don't really um, you know, acknowledge what he has to say about freedom and the role that freedom plays in his analysis of the world. Um, and I think that's where the connection lies. You know, a lot of people get caught up in the 
uh, you know, is existentialism idealist? Um, <laughs> and if it is, then if it's idealist, then it can't work with uh, Marxism because Marxism is materialist and all that other stuff, which in my opinion, I think uh, is not irrelevant, not totally irrelevant, but um, you know, existential, existentialism is working within the, the realms of phenomenology. Every laborer and every individual in the world has lived experiences and those lived experiences are, you know, influenced and affected by capitalism. So, you know, yeah, I think the whole idealist or materialist uh, take on things is kind of, you know, irrelevant in terms of talking about, you know, the connections between Sartre and Marx. Um, because there's a lot, because I think what it does is obscure, you know, a lot what we, a lot more than what we can see. Yeah, and I mean, like, I don't even know if that would be a fair criti- criticism of existentialism to say that it's idealist, because, like, it seems like it would be against most forms of idealism that are sort of mm-hmm. naturalistic or, like, essentialist on that level, mm-hmm. because yeah. of the whole idea of, like, our essence, like, what the meanings of things are not predetermined in some other realm before they're brought into existence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's that's a um, that's a point too that like a lot of people when they like for example when they see the title um, existentialism is a humanism, I think people <laughs> who are unfamiliar with existentialism they they might levy the idealist claim to Sartre and existentialist um, because of that title alone. But what essentially is happening there. Um, and, and and I think you might have probably seen this as you kind of read the paper and picked up on some of the quotes that I drew, drew from that text, is that the humanism that Sartre is working with is nothing like, you know, any liberal humanism or any type of like, you know, scientism that tries to essentially do what religion does, you know, give man or, you know, individuals, I should say, um, give humanity a um, a concrete essence from the from the beginning that they must like then go on to the world to emulate essentially and any type of deviation from that is wrong or is is incorrect or so on and so forth what he does is kind of like turn that on its head and you know say that's not how um human beings work it's in, in fact um the, the, and he says this in the book Nausea, which is a novel, but towards the end of the book Nausea and in Existentialism is a Humanism, he kind of says that, you know, if your idea is, um, if your idea of humanism or, you know, what have you is putting an essence for humanity first before understanding who they are as, like, who we are as existence, then you've also, you, you, you're, you're pretty much in the same boat as the religious folk. You're just not religious. That's all that it is. Yeah. You know, there's no, there's really not a big difference in, in terms of, uh, in terms of what it is like, sure. The religious person might say that might attach the essence of humanity to, um, you know, the, the idea of Imago Dei, if you're Christian or Catholic or whatever. Um, and then the, 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 um, the scientism guy or scientific person might uh, say that, you know, the essence of the individual is to be a clump of cells or whatever. <laughs> when you kind of like when you any type of attempt to kind of boil down the human condition in these kinds of ways, I think, fail. Um, and that's not what Sartre does. And I think um, that, that's not the type of humanism that he, he's trying to put forward. Well, he's talking about consciousness, right? He's talking yeah. about, like, yep. the unique human um, consciousness that experiences things on that mm-hmm. on that level of things. Yeah. It's a, it's a phenomenological kind of humanism is what I try to tell people. Um, sure, they hear humanism and, you know, and I understand because there is a lot of hoopla. <laughs> There's a lot of hoopla <laughs> around hoop- humanism, and I think uh, it does kind of – it can it can throw off discourse so I, I i do understand why some people might be averse to the um the position of humanism well right because it has all of those other connections to all of those different um philosophies that sartre is not even talking about yeah. here but yeah. 